All right, folks, this will be my last lecture on subjects in computer science, perhaps for the term. I might be coming back for one more. If not, you'll be seeing me again in this module from sort of late January onwards. Um, this is a follow-up to what I did last week, my Artificial Intelligence sort of 101. And what I'm doing today is I'm going to cover a few things, and it's really about why we do what we do, why people like me do what I do, and why it's actually quite a challenging thing to do in terms of actually applying artificial intelligence to the games. Why is it that it's actually such a big deal? And then having a look at what the industry has done, or rather has not done, over the 20 or 30 years as it's grown, and really to point out that doing anything that's actually quite cool, I would say, has only really been pioneered in the last 10 years, if that. Um, I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can. There's actually a lot of material to cover, and I did have trouble getting in within an hour last time, but let's do it. So, um, last week I was doing a kind of light-hearted thing of what artificial intelligence actually is, and it all came down to pretty much just rational agents that can make intelligent decisions autonomously. Um, say, it just thinks for itself in a rational capacity, it does not have any morals, ethics, or you know, emotions impacting upon it, it makes the smartest decision it possibly can based on the knowledge it has. They don't really understand that they're potentially being evil. <coughs> You know, that's just really a hang-up that we've got because of the morals and ethics that we as human beings have instilled for ourselves. And also, they don't really have a penchant for destroying humanity yet. We're working on it. One can only hope, right? So, this is kind of the order I'm doing it in. Why do we study AI in games? Why do we do it from a research perspective, never mind actually when we apply it in commercial games? What are the principles of artificial intelligence? in the context of the game. So you're actually going to get a little bit more on foundational theory of AI because if I don't explain it to you, the challenge of what we're doing here isn't really being conveyed. So we're going to talk about it a little bit and I do need someone's help to write something on the whiteboard later on. So be prepared, I will need a volunteer. What relevance does it have to the games industry and where, where are we going with this really in the games industry and what practices have already been applied? So, why do it in the first place? So. You know, people ask me that, well, why do we do AI in games? I'll the fact it's kind of cool. So I throw the question immediately back at you. Why do you play games? And this kind of touches on some of the stuff I did in that game design lecture from two weeks back, where it's all about reward. We kind of, it's, it, games are designed to sort of stimulate our brain's turn-ons, as it were. We're attracted to the notions of reward. We find these cool little patterns <coughs> in games that we like to repeat because they give us this little this little feel-good factor going on in our brain. And that's what helps that you end up enjoying them. Also, they become quite challenging. Like I talked about compulsion loops. The compulsion loops gradually increase in scope and in difficulty the longer you play it in order to maintain that challenge for you and to keep you playing it. And also, you just it's a fun experience to do either by yourself because you feel as if you've got a sense of empowerment. For example, I'm playing Batman Arkham games right now. And uh, the combat in that is always wonderfully empower empowering because you feel like you're Batman. You can take out 12 guys and pull off a 55 hit combo and nobody touches you. You feel invincible. And it's that kind of empowerment you like. And also being able to just own your friends and just being able to show how much they suck in comparison to you. And I swear, I was trying to look for the most stock photo of two people having fun playing games and um, that's one of the few ones I could actually find where they use a real controller. It's always like these kind of really odd looking white plastic controllers that have never existed on any games console ever. It's like the ones that they use, a USB controller that you plug into your PC that looks as if you bought it out of a pound stretcher. <laughs> <laughs> so really those three things, you enjoy them because of the reward structures built within them and well you know what, AI's got a thing about maximising reward based on intelligent decision making. We find them challenging, they stimulate our brain and we force us to think and react. But AI is always thinking about the best way to think and react. And depending on what level the AI is operating at, it can be entirely reactive where it's dealing with it on a frame-by-frame -frame basis in a game, or it's thinking on a sort of larger scale. And the last one, well, fun experiences for a player, well, AI doesn't really have fun. But what can we do with artificial intelligence to make games more fun? To talk really about immersion, maintaining experiences and having... People's really engaged with what's happening. And I think, personally, that this is one of the biggest areas that the industry as a whole is falling behind. Because, for many of you, will pick up Battlefield 4, that's out this week, or the likes of Assassin's Creed 4 as well, Black Flag. 
It's going to look really pretty, the physics is going to be awesome, the gameplay is going to be great, but every non-player character in it is going to be really dumb, and you're probably going to find bugs in it really quickly, and they're going to break that immersion. In fact, I would probably say so far as the likes of Battlefield and Call of Duty just do not use artificial intelligence in any way, shape or form as much as they can, because they'd rather create a simple, crafted, linear experience. It's all about just walking down a tunnel with explosions. <laughs> and you just follow the explosions. So, when we're doing AI research in games, you, one of the things you, you know, as a player, you take an awful lot for granted. If I bring all of you down to like my office or down to the labs later, let's play something. And I talked about this as well in the game design lecture, that we can identify patterns of gameplay very quickly, and we're able to understand our relationship with the environment. You pick it up, you the pad, you start making movements with the pad, okay, I'm beginning to understand how the pad allows me to interact with the environment and then play the game. And we do this remarkably quickly. And like I said, it's because you grok that pattern when you start playing video games when you're much younger, so you can just pick up any first person shooter, regardless of your age, and away you go. But that's a really hard problem to solve. Not just, well, it is hard for us, but we've got quite good at it. You know, humans are kind of clever. For an artificial intelligence, this is actually quite demanding. So even an old game such as Ms. Pac-Man can actually be quite a challenge. And there is, this is actually screenshots taken from the Pac-Man versus Ghosts competition, which if you Google right now, you'll find a website dedicated to it. It's a research pursuit where we are creating Pac-Men, or Ms. Pac-Men, I suppose, actually, to be correct, um, who play the game themselves. The artificial intelligence takes on the role of the player, and it's trying to get as high a score in Ms. Pac-Man as it possibly can. We also like to muck about with the notion of also playing as the ghosts. Can we make the ghosts harder? Now, <clears throat> when I talk about this, so if you're playing as the Pac-Man, or Ms. Pac-Man, how do you model the maze? How do you actually express that in such a way we can clearly see it's a maze, our brains have looked at it, we can abstract it, and then how do we model that in our heads so we understand our relationship with it? Well, we can do this. That's actually not the hard part of Ms. Pac-Man. The hardest part is the second bit. How do you model the behavior of the ghosts? Now, this is why I stress Ms. Pac-Man, because there's actually a difference. Pac-Man, for an AI, is actually quite easy. Once it gets down to training for long enough that it learns how to play the game, and an artificial intelligence can learn to solve a problem. Because, and I'm going to come to this, there's actually certain characteristics about AI problems that dictate their difficulty to a certain extent. There's a difference in how the ghosts work between Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man. The actual thing is that on a certain, at each junction, when a ghost is allowed to make a move, there is a probability in Ms. Pac-Man that the ghosts will do something random. That causes major headaches for an AI to try and solve it. So... We really need to kind of look at these kind of core concepts and how do we model that. And so that's why I'm doing a little bit about knowledge representation. How do we take a game world, or any problem, but I'm talking about games today, and model it in a way that a rational agent can understand it, and then subsequently act within it. And this, there's a whole research field dedicated to this, because it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and it's interesting, uh, I, got, I had the chance to go to a nice um, uh, workshop on this at a conference, the IEEE Computational Intelligence and Games Conference ran this year in Niagara Falls in August, I was out there with some research I published, and we had a really cool session on how you can solve the same problem, but every time you change the knowledge representation, the ultimate effectiveness of the AI can differ. So how, we, how the AI interprets the game ultimately can limit its playability. So, for example, and here's a whole bunch of different metrics that we use. <clears throat> so, coming back to that thing about the AI and the ghosts, the term is determinism. What I mean is, if something is deterministic, I can always predict what it's going to do in the future based on my understanding of how it works. So the ghosts in Pac-Man are deterministic because they have a very prescribed behaviour. It's just a bit of code. <coughs> They'll always do the same thing. In fact, Inky, Blinky, Pinky and Sue all have slightly different behaviour. I can't remember which ones it is for each. However, they all have slightly different ways of trying to chase Pac-Man. Some of them go in front of him, some of them go behind him. 
others actually follow the other ghosts and then do something different. Like I said, in Ms. Pac-Man, there's a probability that at any junction they'll do something random. This makes them non-deterministic. What that means is that I can no longer say with 100% confidence at any point in the game I know what they're going to do next because they might do something random. Trying to model a non-deterministic system is a nightmare. And it's very, very hard to do. And this is actually a big issue in robotics. Because the world, the real world, has a habit of being non-deterministic. Because randomness happens all the time. So, the other thing is observability. And this is about how much knowledge is actually available in the world, and then based on that knowledge, how much can we do? So a fully observable game is chess. I can see every, I can see every position on the board, I can see the full board, I can see every piece on the board. I know what each piece can do, and therefore I can predict any possible action that my other, the other player can do. I don't necessarily know what they're going to do, but I can make assumptions given I can see the board. Poker, on the other hand, is partially observable. Because I only have the cards I've got in front of me, and if you're playing, say, Texas Hold'em poker, <coughs> excuse me, there's also then the cards that are put out throughout the game, um, up to five cards that end up being up there. I don't know what anybody else is carrying. I can make an assumption as to what you're carrying based on what's in front of me and what I've got in my hand, but ultimately I don't know. That is why poker is far more about how much you can bluff your way through things and convince other players that you've got a stronger hand than you actually do. And that's quite a challenging problem. We do actually explore this. There's a lot of AI research in poker and I have done some work on that myself, um, supervising it with others. Whether it's episodic or sequential, now typically all games usually are sequential. An episodic um, problem is one in which all the knowledge that I've accrued for my decision making once I finish that episode, I just start all over again fresh. I never really think about what happened before on the, in the previous episode when I'm going to decide again. Games tend to be sequential in their nature because we're always working towards an end goal. And I put up a racing example, that's uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted, um, from last year. And one of the reasons I put that up is because I'm racing, but I'm also trying to pay attention to where I'm going, where the route's taking me, what the other cars are trying to do. And these all have a big impact on how I steer, how much you know, gas I'm putting into it, and even potentially if I'm braking or not. Whether the game is static, a game such as chess is static, because when I'm going to make my decision, nothing else is happening. I can sit and think and ponder quite happily, right, what am I going to do next? Uh, do I make this? No, maybe I make that move. Call of Duty, for example, is dynamic. Because if I'm standing there going, oh, maybe I should do that. Stuff's happening! Airstripes are getting brought in. People are throwing grenades at me. Five guys can run around a corner with machine guns. I ain't got time to stand there and go, well, maybe if I go that way next, and then maybe I throw a flashbang. No, I'm dead four times already. Because that game is far too dynamic. I don't have that luxury. So you have to be more reactive in your decision making. Um, which then, if you're working in that sort of context, you typically have a layered behaviour. Because you're thinking, what do I need to do right now? And what am I trying to do in the future? Which is typically how humans think about it. Do we, whether it's discrete or continuous, can I discretize this game into little chunks um, such that I can look at it at any given point and say, this is what the game is doing, or this is what's happening in the game? Um, or is it just such, such a state that it's always happening so frequently that I can't really do that? Pretty much any game can be modeled as discrete. Particularly a video game, because games operate on a frame per second. So every frame is a discrete model of what that game is doing at that point in time. So we use all this information to give us a state. The state is all the information that's relevant to us at this point in time. This is the state of the world. So if I'm looking at chess, the state of the world is just where every piece is on the board. Yeah? Straightforward enough. Um, and then what we say is, well... If I've, got all the st if I've got the state, I then know what actions I can make. So coming back to chess, well, if I move that piece, I can move him over there, I can move him over there, I can take that piece, I can come back here. Um, there's lots of different options available to me. Now, actions change the state, of course, because if you take one piece and move it somewhere else, either you take out another player's, the other player's piece, or you just move somewhere else, the state, the information about that point in time has now changed. Now... This can explode in proportion. 
So I want you just to think, you know, I'm not even talking about video games, I'm talking about board games right now. How many states are there in a board game? Not many, you know, a few thousand here or there. So this is getting into a notion called branching factor, where if I've got a state, the branching factor is the number of actions I can commit in that state. So if I'm sitting in a game of, well actually knots and crosses is probably a better example. Because knots and crosses, I'm ultimately constrained, and I'm going to come back to this in a little second, by the board itself. <coughs> so if I'm starting in the this is the initial state of a game of knots and crosses, tic-tac-toe, whatever you want to call it. The branching factor is going to be nine, because I can make nine possible actions. You can put here, 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 here. You don't have the option of doing nothing, because that's not how the game works. So my branching factor is nine. And of course, then there's all possible combinations of states if I was to do that. Then I've got to think about every possible state <coughs> that's going to emerge from there, and what the branching factor at each state is based on all the potential actions the next person can do. So the next person, their branching factor at that state is 8. And so on. So the branching factor in dots and crosses gradually increases. But that's just knots and crosses. So... Here's a nice example. I'm not showing the full uh, branching factor there. So there's the initial state that I've, well, actually the first action's already been committed. I have put my X in the center. So you can see I've just got a trimmed down version of this branching factor because it's like, well, here's three possible actions that the next guy can do. You can either put the knot up at the top, at the bottom, or in the top right corner. And then, well, how do I respond to that? And you can begin to see how the game begins to play out. And you see that we've got a dot, dot, dot. You see there's a lot more that's happening between where we are there and ultimately there's two more actions that need to take place before we get from there to the goal. And the goal is, I've won. So that's a much trimmed down version because trying to put that on one slide is actually pretty big. So, here is the actual state spaces for three simple games. Tic-tac-toe has around 75 unique possible combinations of where the knots and crosses all are on the board. That's how many states exist in the game. Drafts has 5 times 10 to the 20 possible combinations. That means I want you to take the number 5 and put 20 zeros after it. So can I get somebody to come up on the, up on the stage with me for a moment? Because I need a hand. Because Yes, please come on down. Chess. We run on the assumption, and this is a pretty reasonable estimate, that chess has 8.73 times 10 to the 39 possible states. So, your job, while I'm talking, you can take the pen, and we'll start with 873 here. Make it big enough so that all the audience can see. Now, I want you to go and draw 37 zeros after that. <laughs> That's chess. That's a board game. I'm not talking about a video game where the, the actual, every metric in the game, your X, Y, Z coordinate within a 3D space, can be modelled down to several decimal points. I'm not talking about where every possible bullet can be in a first-person shooter. I'm not talking about all the different values that your health can be in a first-person shooter. I'm not talking about where every other player is in a first-person shooter. This is a two-player board game. That's how many, make sure you get it right, possible unique configurations of the board can exist in a game of goddamn chess. I hope you now appreciate how really and hard this actually is. <coughs> now, of course, remember how I talked about mathematically solving checkers or drafts. Would you mind also then doing the 5 times 10 to the 20 underneath? So 5 and 20 zeros. Now, remember I talked about this, that there was a team out in Canada, I believe, who had managed to get so far as to prove mathematically that... If two players play as best as they possibly can, the result of drafts is a draw. That means that they have managed to successfully quantify the outcome of all possible states optimally. That's how many states there are. 
So, I'm hoping that, you know, maybe last week when you went, all right, okay, cool, so if they both played really well, it's a draw, all right, that doesn't seem too hard. But that's after they managed to successfully evaluate and quantify that many different positions or court configurations of a game of drafts. That's why when they told it to the other AI researchers, we all went, no. Because that's freaking huge. It's really hard. And that is also why we're nowhere bloody near doing it with chess. You die before you manage to count up that far in your head. It's impossible. Thank you very much. You're now relieved. <coughs> so, this is fucking hard. <laughs> what have we done so far in the games industry? What are the challenges that are faced are being faced in the industry? And for a very long time, the, the reality of it was, well, we just won't use real AI. Um, you'll actually find, if you go away and do a bit of reading on artificial intelligence and games, the term game AI crops up a lot. And there's always been a bit of an argument between AI researchers and, and developers in the games industry, for, you know, who actually develop AI in the games industry, that whether or not game AI is the same as AI as far as researchers are concerned. It's, it gets a little bit infighty, people bitching, moaning, and they whine at each other. But, and because some, some of that comes from the fact that they would cheat an awful lot. They use a lot of information that you as the player do not have. You play certain games and somehow the bad guys always know where you are. Because they can see through walls. Or because the program just says he's there, dude. Go get him. <laughs> I would go so far as to defend it. Because if you really consider the principles that I talked about last time in terms of an autonomous agent who acts rationally, it's an artificial intelligence. Sure, he's a cheat and get. But it's an artificial intelligence because based on the information it has, it's making the most intelligent decision it can. And what the industry has done is it's focused primarily on two methods. <coughs> One, finite state machines, and also to an extent behaviour trees. Now, I don't really do behaviour trees here, but they are very similar. And I'll kind of come back to this very briefly in a second. And the second thing is A star search, which is pretty good search mechanism that's been defined. It's one of the first ever informed search algorithms you'll ever come across. Now, I'm not going to teach it today because you haven't done search algorithms yet. So to do an informed search algorithm might make a head fall out, given also we just did classes this morning. I think we're quite ready for this. But we can come back to it. And this has been sort of the default approach for about 10, 15 years or so, until probably about 10 years ago when we started kind of changing our mind about this sort of stuff. So a finite scene. Um, or also sometimes referred to as a finite state automata. It, what it is, is you're doing this kind of visual conceptualization of the potential state that a, a character can be in, not the state of the world, but what the state of the character is with respect to the state of the world. And um, the one that I've got here, apologies for the slightly cruddy image quality, is a ghost in Pac-Man. So the initial state of a ghost is he will roam, and he will continue to roam, um, and you know, his roam code, his or her roam code, um, will dictate how they roam. And of course they're always roaming towards the player because that's how they're coded to do so. Um, they might chase, you know, it's not like the best of examples because this isn't exactly accurate to how Pac-Man plays. But if it doesn't see its target, it just continues to roam. And that's what that upper arrow is doing there. If I don't see anyone, I'm just going to keep roaming around. Yes? Uh, I think in Pac-Man... <coughs> One's programmed to chase uh, the player on the route it's been, another one tries to predict the route you're going to go, and uh, I don't know. Really yeah, one goes directly for you, one goes in front of you, one goes behind you, and another one follows what one of the other ghosts is doing and changes it slightly. Yeah. Um, but then, in this example, if you see your target, you start chasing it. So imagine, it's just any predator in a game where it's trying to hunt you down and take you out. Um, and if it continues to see you, it will continue to chase you, and there'll be code that dictates how it chases you. And you can actually put together a finite state machine yourself without much difficulty. If anyone's really keen, I can put a few links up on course resources that do tutorials on how to write it in C-sharp. 
Um, in the event that you no longer, actually, that they're going to kill you, I think here what they've done is they've said if Pac-Man's blue, but in the event that they have got some sort of upper hand on you, you evade them. And you continue to evade them while whatever it is that gives them the upper hand on you persists. But then when it's done, well, if I can see them, I go back to chasing them. If I can't see them, I go back to roaming. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? Everyone understands how that works? So I've always got something I need to do at any point in time. And certain events in the world change how I operate. You could take any bad guy in a video game, whether it's like, for example, the, the soldiers in Metal Gear Solid. How do they work? Well, the soldiers in Metal Gear Solid either wait for audio or visual cues, and then they do the, oh, huh? what was that? Or, huh? Who's there? And then they'll move, they'll move towards the point of focus. Then if they can see you, they'll try and attack you. If not, they will go into some sort of hunting pattern until a certain point where the time is depleted and it goes back into its roaming state. So you can always sort of model them to a certain extent using a finite state machine. For many years that was how it was done. Because you have, as a designer, you can find out pretty quickly what state it is in just by watching it. And you can build states for certain uh, circumstances. The only problem is, this can get really ugly really quickly. And it can get very large. Um, an alternative is to have a behaviour tree. And the behaviour tree often has a <coughs> high level, and based on certain parts of information, certain parts of the tree will end up being executed. So for those of you who have a particular Xbox fetish, that is how the bad guys work in Halo, is they use behaviour trees. Based on information it can see at the top, it will then begin to execute something within one portion of the tree. If it completes this portion of the tree here, it will then maybe look to see if it can execute that part of the tree, or that part, or that part, and it goes through it sort of linearly. It's pretty straightforward, and we can have multiple behaviours existing in different parts of this tree structure. And in fact, <coughs> some parts of the tree can be bigger than others. Um, and then you can customise it. In fact, Halo 2 and 3 use masks to add extra behaviour. There's a default behaviour for all characters, and then they add layers to it, depending on what type of monster it is. The elites, for example, have masks applied to them to make them more intelligent than the standard grunts. Of course, the fun part is how many times, if you waste all that time and energy, do people actually notice it? And I remember reading an interview where when they were beta testing Halo 2 and their new AI technique, nobody seemed to figure out that all their AI was actually different from one another. Or even the fact that they added a new part of the behaviour mask such that if you kill the elite, all the little grunt guys run away and hide. People have sort of figured that out now. But they had all these intricacies that they have to sort of really hammer it home to you. Hey, by the way, if you do this, something cool's going to happen. Because people just didn't see it. A star search is, like I say, it's called an informed search algorithm. Now, you're going to come into search next term. Um, and what we do in search is, if we've got all this information, we're trying to figure out um, what is the best way to find something within this information. Say I've got a big stack of data, and I want to find something. Um, now, you can do that straightforward enough. You can just start searching through this sea of data. But that's, and that's the sort of stuff that you guys will do, different search approaches. They're often not that intelligent. Um, it's sort of a brute force technique. Now, as we just talked about, the number of states that we have can border on being ridiculous. So we have to find an intelligent way to do it. And A star search is possibly the easiest way, or the simplest way, to do something that's actually intelligent. And what we say is, well, I'm going to show an example here. It's actually very good for doing pathfinding. So here's an environment, and what we've done is we've put a bunch of red dots on it. Those red dots represent nodes, path nodes. And the lines between them then dictate where you can travel between all those nodes. So if I'm trying to get from, say, this point over here to that point over there, the simplest way I could do it is do a kind of brute force approach and then say, okay, well, I'll start here, and then I might go to one of them, and then I'll probably go to that, and then one of those two, and then one of those over there, and all of them, and, keep, keep, jump, jump, and you just keep kind of hammering it out in this kind of 
excessive manner to try and find out, well, actually, probably the best way to go is, oh, actually, probably that, to get to the end. So what you would do with an informed search is that these all have a cost. They actually cost you something, a distance value. Maybe you're actually consuming energy to walk. And what the AI does is it goes, right, well, I'm going to factor in how much it costs me to get from one of these nodes to the other one. And then I'm going to make a rough guess as to how far away I am from where I'm trying to go. And that's called a heuristic. What we do is we just go, right, because <clears throat> we couldn't really say, I want to get the cost of this, and then what I know is going to be the optimal cost from all the way through there, because I'd need to actually search and calculate that. That's not feasible. <coughs> And then I need to do it for every possible configuration of all possible nodes to make sure that the one I've picked is the shortest one. Again, not reasonable. So what we say is, right, well, that's how much it's cost me. I'll guess, what's, what's a rough guess for how, how long it's going to take? Well, what I'll do is I'll just compute, what's the straight line distance between there and there? That's a rough estimate because I'm kind of going in that direction. And of, co <coughs> of course... <coughs> That's not accurate either. In fact, it underestimates the total distance. And a heuristic <coughs> has to underestimate. If, if it does, it's referred to as being admissible. And the reason you do that is because you want to make sure that you don't prevent the search from going somewhere it could because you've overestimated the total cost of going in that direction. And of course, this can apply to any direction. So if I'm going from there to there, let's say, right, well, I'll start by going here and then calculate what's the straight line distance. Now, of course, the fun part is that the search will originally go that way because that looks shorter. But then it realizes, well, actually, no, that's the shorter route, and it commits to that one in its final route. But it does this at every transition. So what's the total cost to get to here? And then what's the straight line distance to my goal? And it will gradually do this repeatedly until it gets to there, and it goes, well, this is actually where I was trying to get to. Boom, job done. I win. It picks up the full list of all the different nodes it was going to go to, and it traverses through them. Bob's your uncle. There we go. That is the optimal route. So how nav mesh works? Nav meshes actually constrain this, actually prevent the constraints of this, because a nav mesh, um, as you'll know in this instance, I can only now move between the different nodes. A nav mesh would be different in that we would actually create polygons that exist. We would remove the nodes entirely and have these large polygons that exist across the map. <coughs> then you figure out how to navigate across the polygons, because then the flexibility of your movement is increased. Of course, you've then got to figure out how to navigate within the polygon, which means sometimes you have to create sub-polygons within a polygon, uh, yeah. and then sub-polygons within your sub-polygon, and so on and so on. It's always going to be a tough problem, and because you want to try and prevent it from looking clunky. You can always tell an AI that's following pathfinding. It goes... because it's just following the nodes that the search has prescribed. For those of you on games programming, we'll cover this in the opening weeks of game behaviour in about two years, three years. <laughs> so, there's a number of challenges when you're applying this to games, and I often talk about video games for this. And this is based on not only some of my experience doing this myself, but also talking with games developers and even liaising with developers, doing a little bit of, kind of consultant chat and just generally kind of discussing the problems that we're facing. So, understanding the science and its relevance. What often happens is you can turn around as a researcher and go, dude, we just invented this thing. This totally cuts down the cost of doing this particular type of problem. It's far more optimal than what we did before. This is balls." And they go, why would I use it? And of course the researcher is going, How do you not see this? This is amazing. And they go, well, I don't really see how you can. And sometimes, actually, the best way to do it is the researchers go and do it themselves. There's a really cool example of that at the end of this lecture. But what happens when we just go, fuck it, we'll just make our own game and put our cool AI in it. And then you see that it's actually useful as a playable mechanic. That kind of distills it all really for you. Computational tractability. That's always the killer. So you go, I've got this really cool method. It's going to be able to calculate this particular uh, solution for you. I've now figured out how to solve that problem that you've been dealing with in this series of games for about the last four years. And they go, all right, okay, cool. How does it work? And you explain it. And they go, hang on a minute. You want how much? 
of my CPU time per frame? You've got to be kidding me. That's ridiculous. AI is sort of that ugly child that nobody wants to deal with. Because there's always more text that I can put into my graphics, or my physics, or just any other major part, sound components for example. Certainly dice, I've got a big thing about making sure their audio sounds really funky. When you start suggesting, I always remember, what was it? Um, somewhere, somebody said to me that we should not be dedicating more than 10 milliseconds to do the AI per second in a game. Of course, a lot of the solutions we're coming up with now take 250 milliseconds to come up with something really cool. That is just way too long. They don't like that idea. And we've actually found ways to improve it because one of the interesting things is when they come to us and say, can we use it? We go, well, can we as a research team figure out how to optimize it even further? And we've now got this problem that we've got some really awesome stuff you can't use in a game yet because in computational times, it takes a long time to do it. It's remarkably intelligent, but it's not feasible for use in a game that's going to have to run at 60 frames per second. Multiplayer gaming. This is just more of my personal rant, to be honest. I think multiplayer gaming has actually caused a bit of a setback in terms of development. Because how many games have we now just avoided doing AI programming to make the bots or the other characters in the game more engaging because, bugger it, I'm just going to throw all my budget into the multiplayer mode. The um, uh, Call of Duty approach, as I like to call it. Like I said, Call of Duty, the bots don't do anything intelligent. They're following a very prescribed set of rules. In fact, I wouldn't even go so far as to call them AI. They're scripts. And they're following you down a corridor of explosions. It's a very pretty corridor. Lots of explosions. It's like sort of getting Michael Bay to do your interior decorate. But, and then of course when you get to the multiplayer mode, well I don't need bots. Because people can just kill each other. And then of course that's had a knock-on effect where every game in the last sort of eight years Man, if we're going to be successful, we need a multiplayer component. Let's put a multiplayer in Dead Space or Tomb Raider because they need... No, they didn't need it. <laughs> Wouldn't you be better actually spending your resources on making sure your single player is actually worth playing? Also known as the Bioshock Infinite route. Which I tip my hat to them. There's also one other thing, and I haven't really talked about this because if you think about a lot of the examples I'm talking about, I want to make artificial intelligence for characters in games. I don't want them to be engaging. So... Allow me to introduce my friends, <coughs> Jeff and Bob. That's not actually their real names, because they are from the Locust Horde in Gears of War. Their real name's probably something on the lines of... <coughs> which, I don't even know if I pronounced that right. So we'll just call them Jeff and Bob for the sake of this example. Now, these are bad guys in Gears of War. In fact, these images are the figures of the bad guys in Gears of War. We want these guys, yeah, I mean, this is it, isn't it? I mean, we want them to be intelligent. We want them to be vicious. We want them to be ruthless. I want every time I come across the Locust Horde to be hunted down. I want them to wipe me out. I want to make sure that whenever I come across them, they are always my better. They are never my equal. They should be destroying me. Wait, shit. I want to kill them. I want to kill them in ten. 15, 20 totally unique ways. And then once I figure those out, I'm going to kill them in another 10, 15, or 20 totally unique ways. Gears of War has an achievement built around finding different unique ways to kill them. They have a life expectancy of about 15 seconds. They are designed to die at my hands. So if I make them ridiculously intelligent, I'm going to flip the table and walk out. Because every time, oh, the very first incursion, if uh, any of you who actually happen to play Gears of War 1, you just came out of prison, Dom just helped you out, they're about to break open the door, you get into a defensive position and they come at you. If the first thing they do is they just walk in, two magnums, and they headshot both of you, and you're going, oh, oh, what is that? <laughs> Screw this, man, I'm going back to go and play Call of Duty or something else, I'm not playing this game anymore. No, we don't want them to be like that, we want to kill them, because we have issues. Or so the Daily Mail keeps telling me. <laughs> I don't want them to be omnipotent because it defeats the point of why you have them there. They're there just to stop you from doing a speed run to the end. You want to kill them all. 
And it's kind of, this is to me one of the most interesting parts, because you've got to get that balance right. You're sort of contradicting the rational agent principle that I talked about in the last lecture. We don't want them to be optimal, we kind of want them to be suboptimal. Yeah, I want you to be smart, but I still want to kill you. So how do you get that right? Do you, do you actually lobotomize them? <coughs> and there is one example, one very famous example, where they did do that. So, by the time I've got left, I'm going to look at some pretty cool examples that came out off the top of my head. We've got one or two little videos, and I'm going to talk about how they actually work. And this is something I actually do case studies in game behavior, looking at some of these and talking about how they actually operate to the point that the final year guys can then actually go and implement it themselves. So the first one would be the goal-oriented action planning approach, um, or GOAP as it's called. This takes finite state machines and ASR search, and it does something actually kind of funky. And it came around um, by the team at Monolith Games, who had worked on Nobody Lives Forever, or No One Lives Forever, I can never remember the name of the game. But it was subsequently applied in Fear, First Encounter Assault Recon, that was out on the Xbox 360 as a launch title, and then also on the PC. Anybody played Fear? Let's see, show of hands. Or at least one of them in the trilogy, there's three of them. Oh, okay, okay, we've got a couple of these, you know what I'm talking about. What they did was they came up with this really simple finite state machine. And all it is is three states. Go to a location, run some sort of animation, and use a smart object in the environment. Now, of course, these are very abstract, but they can mean go to a particular point in the world. Use a box and jump over it. Or knock down a bookcase. And the animation would then be the actual animation that it takes from to jump over the box or knock over the bookcase. It could even be just firing at you. Use my gun to shoot at you. And it was pretty cool because they first used it in the Fear Trilogy. Um, and I've got a nice little example or two of that. So if you bear with me a second, I'm going to jump to my prepared YouTube page. See this? Way ahead of you this time. Good show this. We played games where you were part of the special forces team, but the enemies are always just standing around. We wanted to play against the special forces team, so the AI just had to be phenomenal. Pretty much the whole game kind of revolves around the AI. Um, you're interacting with the AI. So how the AI interacts with you is how much you can get immersed in the game. The cool thing about the AI in fear is it's not scripted, it's part of their behavior. So they'll walk out to an area and they'll evaluate what they want to do uh, to get at the player, to get away from the player. Uh, so each time they do that, it's different. We've also added uh, the squad behavior for an AI. So now when you come into an area, you have to fight whole squad. It's not just each individual AI by themselves. It comes back to that focus on close quarters combat. The experience of being in a space with a squad of enemies, and fighting them and defeating them, Really, really satisfying. They actually lie a little bit in that video. I'm going to come back to that in a second. <laughs> so here's a little bit of footage where one of the, the player actually ends up bumping into a bunch of enemies, and we watch how they react, and they all seem to react slightly differently. So let's get the volume up to a reasonable level, so you can hear them all talking to each other, and also you can hear explosions. So, 
What is actually happening? What is it actually doing? Well, what they were doing is they're tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that they don't die. That's their goal. Their goal isn't to be the omnipotent winner of the game. Their goal is to just make sure you don't kill them yet. How they do that is that they look at the immediate state, and we go back to having a look at where they are, and we go, right, where you are now is not a good place to be. You've just spotted the enemy, he is coming at you, the player is coming to kill you. What are you going to do? And it figures out, by running a quick search, I should maybe go to this location. I should then hide behind a smart object, maybe a piece of cover, I'll hide behind it. And then I'll maybe animate um, this kind of the hiding motion. Or it'll then actually try and throw a grenade in order to keep you away, which then gives it time to move into a safe location and again avoid your fire. So this turns into a number of different actions. So it could be the case that, you know, say, this dude over here is actually my enemy. I see you, I have got no cover. I am exposed. So the first thing he does is he actually yells, you know, target sighted. I need to get the hell out of here. I do a quick search, look at the local area. There is a smart object over there that I can use. I can use that as cover. Let's animate that. I resolve my immediate problem. You're still alive though, so I might then try and shoot over the cover. If this wasn't bolted to the floor, I'd probably flip it over. Use that as larger cover to make sure I'm not exposed underneath the table. Keep shooting at you. Talk to my colleagues to help me, and they start to flank. And you think, oh cool, teamwork. It's not teamwork. What's happening is that each of them is operating independently. But somebody had the smart move to say, well, why don't I get it that if one of them starts to flank himself, because he looks and says, right, that dude over there is pinned down, player is shooting at him, I'm going to go for the player to try and, you know, preserve both me and him, because we're trying to stay alive here. I'm going to flank him. Now, if he goes, um, you know, I'm going to flank him, so it gives it away. What it does is it actually tells, in the code, it tells the other guy, flank right. He yells the audio that the other guy actually configured. So he said we should use the flank right audio, but he tells the other person to say it. So he goes, flank right! And then the other guy over there actually starts doing it, and you go, oh my god! <coughs> you know, when he yells grenade out, that's only just so that you panic. And also you think, oh, he's talking to them so they don't get hit with the grenade. Well, no, they're not even paying attention to that. But it fools you into thinking they're a lot smarter than they actually are. Again, yelling target sighted. You think he's telling everybody else. He is, but he's not doing it by yelling an audio, an audio command. So, GOAT has actually been around for a few years, and it's went through a number of iterations and changes. Um, perhaps more famously used in the likes of Fallout and Stalker. It was then used in the likes of Deus Ex Human Revolution, that came out just a couple of years ago, and indeed Transformers War for Cybertron. It turned into a real headache in War for Cybertron because the action space was becoming so big because they had so many bad guys on the screen at once and the actual environment was so large, bearing in mind that people can transform into different vehicles, potential number of states, action space exploded. They couldn't search for it dynamically during runtime, so they had to pre-compute the entire search space before you ran a level, which is why the loading times on that game are ridiculous. It also meant they had um, frame rate issues because they had to store the entire search space for the AI in memory at any given point in time. And they actually tried to fix that in the sequel. We'll come to that next. It's also been used in slightly less ethically valid situations. And here's a, here's a weird story. Um, the first of our research paper I published was in 2007. I went to the IEEE Symposium on Computational Intelligence and there was a symposium running in, on games. That's where I was publishing my work. Super excited, young, kind of fresh PhD student. I get talking to two guys who are working on a military project. They'd actually been receiving funding from the American military. And what they were doing was they were trying to say, well, here's a simulation of an environment. I'm going to bomb it. What I'm doing is I'm going to try and predict what that environment looks like, or the transitions in what happens in that environment from the moment I launched a missile 
to the point it hits the target. <coughs> so, you know, there's a building and it's got a bunch of terrorists in it, going to blow it up. Because they're all sitting there, you're dead, no Americans, and what have you. And um, I shoot the missile thinking, yeah, no problem. But then, just as the missile's about to turn up, there's that school bus full of kids. <laughs> uh oh. And I said, ah, oh, that sounds really interesting. So how do you run the simulations? Oh, we use Go. What? <laughs> yeah, we use the Go Lorry Interaction Planning. So then, this is coming back, I mean, we were talking about it in terms of UAVs and the ethical issues of writing software that can be used on a UAV. This is AI that was developed for a freaking video game. And people started using it to predict location configurations in the event they launch a missile at a target to kill someone. The guys that developed this never actually intended for it to be used for that purpose. But it was equally applicable in that context. So there we go again, that issue of whether or not you know, the ethics of using certain AI technologies. Did it work? Sort you know? of. I freaked out and walked away. Oh, and there were actually, I, read the, I read the paper eventually. Um, one alternative which has then been used to this approach is actually to use real planning techniques, actual automated planning techniques. And one of them is hierarchical task network planning, or HTNs for short. And these are sort of like macros, where I say, well, if I want to get to, to, get to a lecture this morning, I need to get out of my bed, I need to go grab a shower, I need to brush my teeth, put on my clothes, you know, get to the university, find where my class is, and then sit down, and the one I didn't add was shut up. But I thought that would be obvious. And in the case that this character here has lost an enemy, Depending on the information that he has, whether he knows whether he can see the person or he can, he has different tasks. Well, maybe if I can't see him, I move to a searching location and I start doing a searching pattern. Or if I know roughly where he is, I move to a suspected location. Or if I know where he is, turn to face a suspected enemy, and look for him, and if he's there, kill him. That was actually used by Transformers Fall of Cybertron to get around the issues they were having with Go. In fact, it had been pioneered by work done by Guerrilla Games in Kill Zone 2 and 3. Um, there's actually a really good article on this that comes up on a website that I'll link to later on. Subsequently been used in the likes of Max Payne and Deep Dark Souls. Autonomous learning, and this is me pretty much done. This is a lot of stuff that hasn't quite made it into the industry yet, but a lot of researchers do it. And these are actually some really cool stuff that people like myself and actually a few of my friends have worked on. So, we want to use an AI algorithm to learn to solve a problem, and it can do it. We can learn to solve issues. So, in fact, the very first piece of AI I ever did, I created an evolutionary system that evolves a bot for a game. And it works. But you breed it. You actually create a false Darwinian mechanic, and you breed it on a computer. Sounds a bit crazy, but it does actually work. So, one of the things we did was learning to create bots. Then we wanted to look at models of human players, and this is actually something from Tomb Raider Underworld that a bunch of guys at the ITU, which is the IIT University of Copenhagen, um, a colleague of mine, Yergos Yanakakis, had worked with a couple others on a project where they actually watched Xbox Live network data that had been given to them by the developers to watch how you play Tomb Raider Underworld. And they discovered that uh, a whole bunch of people don't play Tomb Raider the way you think you're supposed to play Tomb Raider. People avoided trying to do certain puzzle bits. Some people tried to avoid fighting the bad guys. They tried to find the cheekiest ways to avoid the platforming segments. They were kind of interested to see they could actually bring you down to three or four categories of type of people that play uh, Tomb Raider. Bots that play like humans. This is actually Unreal Tournament 2004, the 2K bot prize sponsored by 2K themselves. Remember the Turing test I talked about, an artificial intelligence test to see whether or not the AI can, be, can trick you into thinking it's human. This, you're supposed to create a bot that can trick another player into thinking it's not a bot and it's actually a human player. And what they do is they create servers full of bots and humans and you've got to figure out who the bots are. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, learning rules for games, and in fact even creating levels for games, which is the top example. Uh, this was the PCG Mario AI competition. Well, the, the task of it was to create procedurally generated Mario levels. You actually create the level yourself using an AI system which is watching you and then trying to figure out based on how you play Mario, what kind of Mario games, you, Mario levels you would like to play. Weapons, that's my next slide, and even games themselves, we've not got very far with it yet, some of the results are a bit wacky, but then that, you just blame Julian for the alias for that because he has a bit of a nutter, love him though I do. And 
this is one of the things we're really looking at at the moment, and I'm quite excited about this, is procedural generation. I mean, we all know procedural generation from Borderlands, for example, where it creates new guns based on certain information about the game. We are not even doing that. We want to have a look at artificial intelligence that can build weapons based on your interests and how you play a game. So I want to leave you with, this is the last bit of this lecture, pretty much, before we walk out. This is a game called Galactic Arms Race. It's on Steam now. It's a couple of quid. So do, do us a favour, go out and buy it. It's a really guy that made it. It is a space shooter simulation where the guns are entirely generated by the artificial intelligence based on how you play the game. I've got galaxy walls at home. So all the guns are particle effects. And the cool part is the guns will change based on what guns you use and how you fire them. <coughs> and so hopefully you're going to see in a second some of the different weapons it creates. It's got a really simple system. The guns you like to shoot are the guns it's going to create new variants of. If you really like the gun, keep using it, keep killing people with it. And then it goes, he likes that gun, I'm going to make new guns that are similar but different. If you don't like it, don't use it. If you do like it, keep shooting it. So they've been working on this for a few years now, and it's pretty awesome. And there's lots of guns out there that you can eventually experiment with. Well, I'll have to wrap up there because we're very close to running out of time. So by all means, get out onto the internet and look for Galactic Arms Race. Steve! For anybody really keen to have a look at some stuff, I advise checking out AIGameDev.org, which is a website dedicated to game AI in the industry. And lastly, AIGameResearch.org, which is a website run by researchers talking about the cool games that we are developing and the cool research we're doing. I also happen to be a member of the editorial board, so do us a favour and go have a look. Thank you.